SVP and third year cancer biology graduate student. I have the honor of introducing Dr. Stephen Hennikoff as our speaker today. Dr. Hennikoff is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and a professor of the Basic Sciences Division at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Dr. Hennikoff earned a BS from, in chemistry from the University of Chicago. He earned a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from Harvard working with Dr. Matthew Nesselson on RNA from heat-induced puff sites in Drosophila. He did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Washington, working with Dr. Charles Laird on position effect variegation in Drosophila. Dr. Hennikoff has been a faculty at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and University of Washington since 1981. He has, he has been a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator since 1990. Dr. Hanikoff was elected into the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 2005. He was elected as a fellow of the American Associ Association for the Advancement of Science in 2012 and elected as chair for the Biological Sciences section in 2015. Dr. Hanikoff has been invited as key keynote speaker at numerous symposiums, both nationally and internationally, including at the NIH and AACR. He has served on the editorial and advisory boards for many societies and programs, including for the Cancer Genome Atlas and the Keystone Symposium. Dr. Hennikoff has mentored over 60 postdoctoral fellows and graduate students. Dr. Hennikoff has contributed significantly to science. His contributions range from innovations in methodology, such as the BLOSA matrices used in sequence alignment of proteins and cut and run chromatin, profi chromatin profiling techniques to advancements in epigenomics and cancer biology. He and his lab currently work on understanding the regulation of mucosome dynamics and transcriptional regulation as they pertain to cancer biology. Now, I would like to thank Dr. Hanikoff for sharing his research here at the University of Colorado Cancer Center Symposium. I hope you all enjoy Dr. Hanikoff's presentation titled, Genome-Wide Mapping of Protein DNA Interaction Dynamics. Please type your questions for Dr. Anikoff in the chat box and I will call on you to unmute and ask your questions during the Q&A following the presentation. Thank you and Dr. Anikoff, you may take it away. Thank you, Joe, for the kind introduction. Also the invitation to come here and tell you about some of our recent work. Uh, but let me start out by explaining what I mean by dynamics in the title. Now the active processes that take place in our genome, whether it be replication, transcription, transcription, active binding, whatever, must occur in the context of a landscape that's dominated by nucleosomes. And these nucleosomes create impediments for these processes. So to make this clear, you're looking here at a stripped down version of the nucleosome core, just showing the histone fold domains. So you can see that the DNA just tightly wraps around it. And you can imagine that a process such as transcription is gonna have a problem here because RNA polymerase has to push a denaturation bubble through this thing and then it has to plunk down the, the histone core right behind it as it passes. And so uh, this is really highly dynamic kind of process that we'd like to better understand. But, but we found that over the years that have been available for taking a genomics approach to studying dynamics have not really been very well suited. And so we developed some methods of our own. And so I'd like to start out by telling you how we currently map the chromatin landscape, then turn to some interesting questions in chromatin biology, beginning with uh, how do nucleosomes get assembled? What's the dynamics of that? Uh, chromatin remodeling, we'll talk a little bit about that. How does, how does a chromatin remodeler know where to go? And then finally, what's the end process of remodeling that is accessibility, something that uh, maybe will surprise you. Okay, but let's get started with the mapping issue. Now, you're probably familiar with chromatin immunoprecipitation, which has been around since the mid 1980s, where ChIP-seq has been the method of choice for the past do dozen or so years for most people. However, ChIP-seq's not the only way to do to map the chromatin landscape. There's methods that are referred to as enzyme tethering methods, an early one of which was introduced by Bas Van Steensel, uh, what we call DAM-ID, where we made a fusion protein between 
between E. coli demethylase and a chromatin protein of interest, and then we'll methylate the adenines of DATC sites in its vicinity, and then it comes down to mapping where the methyls are. Then a few years later, Uli Lemley's group introduced chromatin endogenous cleavage, substituting micrococcal nuclease or MNase for DAM. And that takes advantage of the base pair resolution that's possible with MNase. And Gabe Zentner, when he was a postdoc in the lab, converted this from a southern blot readout into a full sequencing based method. But it's really this chromatin immunocleavage or a chick method that we've done the most with, and it goes like this. In our version of this, we mix live cells with lectin-coated magnetic beads. They stick, we permeabilize. We then add an antibody, say to a transcription factor. We follow that with a fusion protein between protein A and MNase. Protein A will bind to the antibody, anchor the MNase such that we can activate it with calcium. Now, in our version of this, uh, what we call cleavage under targets and release using nuclease or cut and run, we allow the complex to diffuse out into the supernatant, extract the DNA, ligate on adapters, and fly the libraries for sequencing. When Hadija Kaya Kur was a postdoc in the lab, she substituted TN5 for MNase, where TN5 is the cut and paste transposase that's the basis for the Illumina uh, ne the next and next era system or, and the ataxic method. In our case, we're tethering to the antibody such that we can activate the TN5 with magnesium. It drops its payload of sequencing adapters. We then extract the DNA, amplify the libraries for sequencing. And this takes one day from live cells to purified sequencing ready libraries. And the backgrounds are very low compared to chip C. And that's because unlike ChIP-seq, where you start out by solubilizing the entire cellular contents, then you add an antibody to pull a needle out of a haystack. In the case of these two methods, <clears throat> we only solubilize the little bit of DNA that's in the vicinity of the antibody, and this keeps the backgrounds low. Now, we've always been trying to improve our, our methods. One way that we could improve cut and tag is to eliminate this DNA extraction step. And we found that we could do that by adding a little bit of SDS and heating it up. And that releases the TN5, which is tightly bound to the DNA after tagmentation. And then because the SDS will inhibit the PCR, we add an excess of the non-ionic detergent triton that forms my cells around the SDS and prevents it from inhibiting the PCR. And that means that we can carry out all these reactions in a single PCR tube. Now, when the pandemic hit and I had to shut down the lab, I realized, well, this is easy enough to do. I could set it up on the corner of a counter in the laundry room in my house. And the, all you need is some surplus equipment and a little bit of <clears throat> non-toxic reagents and some usual supplies. And that's enough to get very high quality data as illustrated here. So what I'm showing here is a comparison of chip seek from the ENCODE project using the same antibody as what we use monoclonal as what we used in with cut and tag from human K562 cells. And I'll be talking quite a bit about H3K27 trimethylation, which is the mark of polycomb silencing, which is put on by the PRC2 pr uh, protein that I'll talk more about. But basically for our purposes here, I just wanna use it to illustrate the difference between chip seek and cut and tag. Whereas chip seek, you are sampling from the entire genome. So you're always going to get a low background and you have to build up the features above that. Because of the low backgrounds for cut and tag, we don't need as many cells because you're going to need for chip seek to do this coverage. You're going to need lots of unique reads and therefore you're gonna need upwards of a million cells, but we can go down here with cut and tag to on the order of about a hundred cells to get, uh, to get excellent feature definition. It doesn't matter whether it was done by the extraction method or at home or in the lab with the direct method, it basically uh, work, works, works pretty well. Now, because of the nice features of cut and tag, and I should point out that it's also much cheaper because you don't have to sequence as deeply in order to get good feature definition, we wanted to convert this to an automated approach 
to apply uh, in general. And this shows a proof of concept experiment where Derek Jansen's, he made a, he, auto, he automated, cut, fully automated cut and run and cut and tag. So let me just run through it in the context of an experiment here, which is a proof of concept for using this for using this on 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 tissues. These are thawed flash rose and mouse brain tumors. And this is work of Jay Sarthi, a pediatric oncology fellow in the lab, who's been keen to apply this to patient samples for <clears throat> for uh, for general for uh, general application. So what Jay did was disaggregate. He mixed with the uh, beads. He then arrayed 96 volt format, and we placed the plate on a on a robot that's present in our genomic shared resource, and carried out all the cut and run reactions up to addition of barcoded adapters. Followed that by PCR. Put it back on the robot to clean it up. Did some QC, mixed some samples, did paired end sequencing. Well, we price this out. Our in-house sequencing costs only about fifty dollars per sample, which is quite quite affordable to get enough reads in order to get good chromatin profiles. But it turns out that we can do even better with cut and tag, and this shows cut and tag, which is being applied here to a patient sample. In this case, a uh, leukemia sample. I'll say more about in a moment. But I just want to point out that here we are profiling for four different histone modifications, each giving a different chromatin readout. Now, this sample is part of a study that Derek carried out for mixed lineage rearranged leukemias. And these are fusions involving the KMT2A gene, where KMT2A is this very large multi-domain protein. It's the N-terminal domain, which is the DNA interaction domain. And in the leukemias, it involves a fusion where, where there's a breakpoint region followed by the chromatin interaction part, typically of these four chromatin regulators, but some 80 different fusion partners have been found for KMT2A and that's driving these leukemias. Now, what makes matters even more complicated is that sometimes these leukemias present as lymphoid, sometimes as myeloid, and sometimes they'll start out as lymphoid, and then after treatment, they might recur and then recur as myeloid. And that makes it especially difficult to treat and understand. And so our approach to addressing this serious issue is to first identify oncoprotein targets. And we use auto cut and run for that. So here we're using an antibody to the N terminus of KNP2A and one to the C terminus, where if the oncoprotein is present and it'll be in the presence of the endogenous protein, we would expect to see more of the N terminus than the C terminus when they're normalized the same. And this shows an example. These are two known targets of KMT2A fu oncoprotein fusion in this particular cell line. And what you can see is that, that when they're normalized the same, you get an excess of N-terminal labeling. So we can identify oncofusion protein targets. Now, we then turn to cut and tag and profile various histone modifications and notice something interesting. When we do use a H3K4 trimethylation, which is a mark of active promoters, and the promoters here are indicated by these arrowheads. In addition to the promoter labeling, as we expected, we also see that often in the vicinity of the where the fusion is actually occupies, we see that there's a barren uh, promoter mark here in the gene bodies. And that that's that tells us that perhaps we can use this mark as a guide to tell us about the effectiveness of treatments. So we tried that out with a couple of drugs that are used in the clinic, the, a DOT1L inhibitor and a menin inhibitor. And we can see that the DOT1L inhibitor had very little effect. However, the menin inhibitor had a very strong effect in reducing the aberrant labeling at 
concentrations that are well tolerated and in a proliferation assay are quite effective. So we think that autocut and tag and autocut and run together can be used in general on, on fusion proteins. Uh, and we think that th this will find its way in the clinic. But there's something else about cut and tag that's quite notable, and that is that it's very well suited for single cell profiling. And that's because we can do all the reactions in a single PCR tube and up to the point of tagmentation and everything holds together. So that means that we can, we can dispense the cells with a high throughput format. We started out with the the iCell8 system, and most of the data I'll be showing you comes with this. Now, the iCell8 system is a 72 by 72 array of nanowells in which we can do, using uh, robotics, we can, we can do barcoding uh, in a 72 by 72 format, and that gives us some 5,000 or more cells. And we can also use, uh, we can also run multiple experiments on a single chip. In this case, we're looking at this mark of polycomb silencing that I referred to previously. And this is work of Stephen Wu, a graduate student in the lab who differentiated human embryonic stem cells in definitive endoderm over a five day period. And this shows a UMAP representation of a trajectory that we can infer over the five day period where each circle represents a single cell. Now, a couple of nice features of this particular mark for single cell profiling. First of all, as I showed previously, there's a lot, it covers a good chunk of the genome. So there's lots of information there where for single cell sequencing limiting, one thing that's limiting is how many, how much, how many fragments per cell you can get. And this has a lot of fragments uh, because it covers so much of the genome. But even more importantly, it's very informative because it's the mark of developmental silencing. And over the course of differentiation in general, you see increases in these, in these domains. So it's very informative because over the course of differentiation here, we see uh, almost a two order of magnitude increase in the total amount of H3 K27 trimethyl. So we're quite keen about this and I'll be talking about it later. Uh, but I'd also like to point out that it works on other platforms as well, a single cell cut and tag on the, on the popular 10X genomics platform. And here we've applied it to a tumor, a glioblastoma with our, with our colleagues, our clinical colleagues. And you can see that we, that we can use this mark to be to inform on this tumor and, and infer trajectories from it. But what I'd like to actually drill down a little bit deeper into the strategy of using single cell profiling for, uh, for cancer, uh, going back to this KMT2A fusion study. Now, uh, now uh, Brad Bernstein, uh, quite a long time ago, defined something called bivalent marks, which are marks of promoters that share H3K4 trimethylation within regions of H3K27 trimethylation. Now, this shows a heat map representation, I'll be showing a lot of these, where we've lined up, oh, in this case, over the transcriptional start site, we've lined up the marks and ordered them by occupancy, and then done unsupervised clustering into three categories here. And you can see that, that these promoters are marked with K4 ME3, but not K27 ME3 and vice versa for these. However, these, so these are the bivalent ones, about a quarter of the promoters that show th that, that are positives within the, uh, in this assay. And one thing that Derek uh, Jansen who did this work noticed was that the fusion targets going from one, from one patient sample to another were quite inconsistent. And that inconsistency was associated with bivalency. And so he went ahead and did the same study, but now with the same two marks, but now in single cells. So here on the left, you see the UMAP representations for eight different cell lines or, or, or primary tumor samples. 
And as you'd expect, you get eight different clusters. And likewise for K27 trimethylation, you get eight different clusters. But let's look closely at one of these clusters, this one for the primary mixed lineage leukemia is one that switched from one to the other. And we see something pretty interesting here. First of all, if we look at, at the targets that came out of this, and these turn out to be known targets for mixed lineage leukemias, we see that, for example, for HOXA9 compared to MICE1, they show differences in this promoter mark in the same cells, but different genes, even though they're targets of the fusion protein. And so that indicates that, that there are two different, uh, and other leukemia, and leukemias they, the, in, in bulk, they, they, they both tend to be activated, but, but it looks as if only MICE1 is activated, not HOXA9. And perhaps even more interestingly, if we look in the same, in the same uh, sample, but different cells within the same sample, looking at H3K27 trimethylation, you see that there's that in some cells it's it's marked, it's not marked, and other cells it's strongly marked by by the silencing. And what this tells us, we think, is that the lineage plasticity can be detected using this approach that's responsible for the, the epigenetic instability that gives rise to, for example, uh, presents as lymphoid and then will relapse as myeloid. And so we think that actually uh, this kind of approach using single cells will someday find its way into clinical use. Finally, I'd like to point out that we can go further with this general approach by something that my nearest postdoc in lab is called a multi-tag, it's a multifactorial approach, goes like this. My conjugates antibodies for say histone modifications with, with adapters for TN5, so they're covalent conjugated, and then, and then uses that, in this case, with one adapter that's used for, uh, that's used for tagmentation and using multiple antibodies doing barcoding and then success, success, in succession using multiple antibodies, then following that with a conjugated secondary antibody with the other, with the other adapter and then, and then doing the tagmentation again and then doing sequencing. And this works pretty well. So this shows if the experiment is done with just a single antibody, say H3K27 trimethylation, or three different antibodies, each independently conjugated. We we know we see that that there's good separation, that there's uh, really uh, no no read through, so we can get separate profiles for the different modifications. So he's applied this on the I cell eight, either for human embryonic stem cells, H1 cells, or K562 cells, very different cell types. Uh, and we uh, and we can separate them even when they are mixed together, and so this shows the the UMAP representation. We get very <coughs> distinct. Uh, we get distinct uh, clusters with the independently with these two different marks with very little uh, very little overlap. So so these are the tools that we have. So now let's turn to some interesting questions in chromatin biology. And I'd like to start out with, uh, with how are nucleosomes assembled? And to get at this, I'd like to uh, go to give you a little background in the in two different histone variants uh, that we originally studied in Drosophila. And they're the major form of histone H3 and the minor form H3.3. And these differ, so they're very similar. They differ by only four amino acid residues. One is on the tail and there are three in a cluster on the core. Now, what made this interesting was 20 years ago when Kami Ahmed was postdoc in the lab, he, he noticed something interesting. He made GFP constructs for these two forms and this shows the H3 pattern. Now, you, you, by looking at the patterns within Drosophila cells, you can determine whether it's an S phase cell. And if it is an S phase cell, if it's early or late. And that's because all the late replicating heterochromatin forms a chromocenter that sits on the edge of the nucleus. So you can see that here. 
And so this would be a late S phase cell. This is an early S phase cell. But what I'd like you to notice is that there's no H3 labeling outside of replication. So this means, so this told us that it's replication coupled in its deposition. And then what Kami found was that with H3.3, he did see replication coupled assembly, but also saw replication independent assembly. And it was odd because there's this one sharp label, there's this one point of labeling on one chromosome. And that turns out to be all of the active ribosomal DNA genes in the, in the fly, in the fly cells. So what we're seeing is we interpret as transcription coupled. So you have replication coupled and both replication coupled and transcription coupled that distinguish these two. And Kami could show that by making the swaps between these and showing that indeed these three, these three residues are the ones that really matter. And later other people showed they're different histone chaperones that put these in. So they're two different pathways for nucleosome assembly. Now, where this all becomes relevant, uh, I, okay, so first of all, I should mention that although I, we did this experiment, this in Drosophila, there's a hundred hundred percent identity between histone H3 and human H3.2 and histone H3.3 and, and Drosophila H3.3. So they're absolutely identical. Uh, H3.1 just has one different amino acid residue, but it's also replication coupled in its assembly. Now, 10 years after that, the, the, these papers appeared describing oncohistone mutations in pediatric brain tumors for both H3.3 and H3. These are, are extremely malignant. There is no, there's uh, no long-term survival. Uh, they're in a funny place. Uh, in the uh, in the midline, and they are H3 K27 that gets lysine gets converted to methionine, and mostly they're H3.3, though sometimes they're H3.1. Now, there are some 16 histone genes, each present in two copies, being diploid, but it takes just one allele to be lysine 27 methionine mutation to drive cancer, which is quite remarkable when you consider that it's only a few percent of the total, and yet it, 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 it has this very malignant effect. Now, we know what the target is from studies from many different labs several, several years ago, and that is the enzyme PRC2 that's responsible for H3 K27 methylation, both monodi uh, and trimethylation. And so, so this together with what I showed you from our earlier work in Drosophila made us think that, well, maybe the fact that it's so powerful has to do as a, as a <clears throat> in driving cancer, it has to do with the fact that in both cases, you have replication coupled deposition so that would mean that right behind the replication fork, even at low concentration, there's going, you're going to poison the entire genome for PRC2 to methylate H3K27. So our model is that it's replication coupled incorporation of the oncohistone that ultimately is responsible for, for driving these, these uh, brain cancers. Okay, well, Jay Sarthi, our pediatric oncology fellow who is leading this, uh, this work, did cut and run on glioma-derived cell lines. So this just shows if we line up over the transcriptional start side, a heat map, ordering by the cystone mark, we line it up and do the comparison, and cut and run is very sensitive, and it shows the difference among all three of these, whether it's the oncohistone, that is H3.3 or the oncohistone with H3.1, you can see that they're different. H3.3 shows what we expected, which is replication independent assembly, transcription coupled assembly goes in with RNA polymerase. And we don't see that for H3.1. What we do see for both of them that distinguish it from a glioma that does not have a histone mutation is that there's this low background overall, which fits with the idea that, that it's getting deposited, the onco 
histone is getting deposited throughout the genome. So that's the oncohistone, but what about the histone modification that is responsible for H3K27 trimethylation? And here we do this unsupervised clustering, as I showed previously, into four categories. And, and you can see immediately that there are big differences between the, between the glioma without a histone mutation and these two oncohistones. Uh, uh, these two oncohistone uh, cell lines, and uh, this is neural stem cell control. So you can see that these look more like what you see for embryonic stem cells, where there's global depletion of, of, this, of this mark. As, as I pointed out, embryonic stem cells have very little in general of this. So, so basically most of these polycomb silence regions are no longer silenced. <coughs> And by, by methylation, at least. Okay, but there's even something uh, also interesting. If we look at these two classes down here, what you see is that there is a big difference between H3.3 and H3.1. We don't see any loss of H3.3 uh, methylation. We don't see methylation where, it's a, where, the, uh, onco, where the oncohistone is an H3.31, but we do see complete wipeout for H3.1. And when we look closely at an example here, so this is a large domain that is where we're seeing this domain of K27 trimethylation over the GATA3 transcription factor gene. And what we see is that we get complete loss, almost complete loss for h 3.1. And this implies that in addition to the global, to the global depletion that we see throughout the genome, there's also this local depletion. And it's not as if there's no PRC2 there, because if we look at a subunit of PRC2, SUS12, what we see is that there's a lot of PRC2 there. So that means that PRC2 is being locally inhibited there. So let me just put this into a model that I think makes a lot of sense and can explain the patterns that we see. And that is that, as I told you, H3.3 is transcription coupled, so it goes into sites of activity in a replication independent manner, and only a little bit is left to go in throughout the genome behind the fork relative to the major form, H3.1 and 2, which will go in throughout and when they are the oncohistone, they will basically get the entire genome. And polycomb domains, by definition, don't have, are silent, are repressive, so they don't have any active sites, and that can account for the patterns that, that we see. Okay, so now, uh, now that I've introduced nucleosome assembly, now let's see what happens after assembly with, uh, that is mediated, the dynamics mediated, by what's called chromatin remodeling. And what I'd like to just give you a little background in is work that Sandipan Brahma postdoc lab did in his study of the yeast risk complex. Now risk is a large ATP utilizing machine that is the only essential remodeler in yeast. And its job is to keep promoters free of nucleosomes. And by our model and work that I'm not gonna go through, uh, our model is that risk is targeted because it has a DNA interaction module that has two sequence-specific DNA binding proteins, RIS3 and RIS30, that will recognize motifs such as this that are found in most yeast genes and, and risk acts at most yeast genes. Now, by the model, we, we think that risk will start grabbing nucleosome let's say one that gets incorporated behind the replication fork, and then it will slide it along using the energy of ATP to slide that octamer core along. And in so doing, it can expose the binding site for a transcription factor that would otherwise be blocked. And we looked at a couple of factors that are essential factors that are general regulatory factors found at most yeast genes. And what we think happens is that we know that risk is able, in vitro at least, to evict the nucleosome core. And we think that, that this <clears throat> combined with the fact that the transcription factor has only 
resonance times, dwell times at its site of only a few sec of only seconds, that that this will basically expose the DNA again. And then over the course of the cell cycle, new nucleosome will get put in and RISC will do it. So we think of this as a cycle, a dynamic cycle that RISC is working on. Now, RISC has a counterpart in, in vertebrates, which is uh, what's been referred to as the Brahma associated factor or the BAF complex. And you can see from the color coding that they share most of their core subunits. For example, STH1 in RISC is the counterpart of BRG1 typically in the, in the BAF complex. But what is striking to us is that the BAF complex does not have a DNA interaction module. And we're particularly interested in BAF because it's mutated in more than 20% of human cancers. So it's getting a lot of attention, but there are some open questions about how BAF works. The main one that I'm gonna address here is how does BAF know where to go if it doesn't have a DNA interaction module? And there've been models for this. So one idea is that there's a transcription factor that might sit on the surface of a nucleosome and recruit the BAF complex. Well, that might work for one transcription factor, but since BAF works at most genes, then you would need it would need you need to think that that there must be on the order of a thousand transcription factors all can recruit the BAF complex, and that's not a very parsimonious model. Uh, a, a better model would be one in which there are histone reader histone modification reader domains, such as Bromo domains, that are found on the BAF, on various BAF subunits that will recognize this mark that's found on promoters that get remodeled, on, on nucleosomes that get remodeled, as well as uh, H3K4 uh, methylation that I already referred to. But what Sanapan wanted to look at was the possibility that RNA polymerase II is what's responsible for bringing in BAF. And you can imagine that, that they'll work together in the sense that RNA pol 2 if it can bring in BAF, BAF can remove the nucleosome anytime one comes in, and that makes it easier for RNA, uh, RNA pol 2 to get started and to form <clears throat> and for pre-initiation complex to form. And the approach that he used was to use small molecule inhibitors of different steps in the initiation process. Triptolide is an inhibitor of the helicase that's responsible for opening up the denaturation bubble, opening up the pre-initiation complex so RNA polymerase can get started. Then it'll move forward and pause, and we can inhibit the release of the pause by actinomycin D, which is an intercalating compound, but we can also inhibit it with flavopyridol. That inhibits the CDK9 kinase, which is responsible for putting a phosphate on serine 2 of the heptapeptide repeat present in 52 copies on the, on the C-terminal domain of the largest subunit of RNA polymerase. And that's needed to release uh, for pause release. And we can inhibit that. So what we're going to look at is serine 5-phosphate. Serine 5, we can think of if this is ready, set, go, it's the set point in between because it gets lost during elongation. And so therefore, if we inhibit with triptolide, we would expect that we would lose, uh, we know that we would lose RNA polymerase. So this, so the mark would go away. But if we inhibit, if we inhibit pause release, then just the opposite will happen, that this will build up and we'll see a buildup of the serine 5-phosphate. Okay, so here's the experiment, and Sandipan did this in mouse embryonic stem cells. And what you can see is this heat map representation where we line up all the peaks for serine 5-phosphate after cut and tag. And as expected, what triptolide does is it causes the RNA PAL2 to go away. And the, so that means that the pause PAL2 goes away. And when we look at the at the BAF complex, looking at cut and tag for BRG1, we see that, that you get a nice signal. And what we see is that with triptolide, it also goes away, although more slowly, suggesting that RNA pol 2 stabilize, pause pol 2 stabilizes BAF on chromatin. And we see the same kind of thing with actinomycin D. We see that concomitant with 
BRG1 buildup, we also see that uh, with, uh, concomitant with RNA pal 2 buildup because we inhibit it, we inhibit pause release, we see that BRG1 builds up. What we also see with actinomycin D is that these marks, these active marks that have been implicated uh, by some, by models in promoting uh, and <clears throat> bringing in BAF actually are unnecessary. So BAF binding is independent of active histone modification, further suggesting that, that pause PAL2 targets BAF for promoter clearance. Now, promoter clearance means making the DNA accessible for, for pre-initiation complexes to form and for transcription factors to bind, which brings me to the last part of my talk, which is on chromatin accessibility. Now, you may be familiar with chromatin accessibility because mapping chromatin accessibility is something that's been done since 1980 with, the, with these two papers where they showed that DNA one can be used as a probe to map the five prime ends of active genes. And this became, uh, this, uh, this is sort of the granddaddy of various methods that have been introduced for chromatin accessibility. After DNA one, there's micrococal nuclease, or restriction enzymes, DNA methyltransferases, and transposases. Now, these are all probes of the holes in the, in the landscape, but there's also these other methods that involve cross-linking and sonication, and where the chromatin breaks more easily, that is, that is where accessibility is mapped. Now, you realize that there is a real conceptual problem here because they're all mapping, they're all measuring holes, but there's no ground truth, you know, like who dug the hole, right? This is, these are just probes. And this has been this way for over 40 years. What is the ground truth that underlies all of this? And that goes unspecified. Now that doesn't mean that people haven't come up with models. So here's a model for chromatin accessibility profiling from the leaders in the field. And basically what they're showing here is you've got enhancers that are free of nucleosomes, they have transcription factors, you have promoters that also have PAL2, but they're also free of nucleosomes. However, I'd like to show you that actually this model uh, does not explain the, the data. So here's an experiment that was done by Mike Mears, postdoc in the lab. He was studying so-called pioneer factors, one of the best studies of which is FOXA2, and he's looking over a differentiation series from here human embryonic stem cells to definitive endoderm over a five-day period. FOX2 is expressed by day two or three, but it's accessible based on a tax seek. That's the transposase-based method. Based on a tax seek, you can see that, yes, there's an increase in occupancy, although the increase begins even before FOXA2 comes on the scene. But Mike also did cut and run for histone modifications. And we see that for these two active modifications, we see that they show the same behavior as accessibility. So what that means is at the same time that they're becoming accessible, supposedly open, they're also becoming closed because they're getting nucleosomes there. So how can you be both open and closed? Well, the concept is just, is just naive. It's just, just not right. It basically is that, that this model ignores the dynamics. And I already talked about the dynamics in the context of the BAF complex and how RNA PAL2 can bring it in. Can we find evidence that what we're looking at here, in this case, when we're doing a taxi, actually follows the same rules of dynamics? And that's what I'm going to show you in the last part of the talk. Okay, so uh, we sort of stumbled over this in developing cut and tag. We noticed that, that when you that the protein A part will bind to the antibody for the targeting, the TN5 part will go to all the accessible sites throughout the genome. And that's an artifact for us because how do you know whether it's an accessible site or a targeted site? And we found that we could suppress that by adding 300 millimoles sodium chloride where the salt competes for electrostatic interactions between, in this case, between the TN5 and the DNA that it's bound to. And this works. So if we look at H3K4 dimethylation, which marks both enhancers and promoters, as does the taxi, we see that if we line up over the ataxic sites in this heat map representation, 
we can see that flanking the ataxic sites out about a kilobase on either side, we see good occupancy of K4ME2, but very little occupancy right over the site itself. But it turns out that if we make one little change to the buffer during fragmentation only and use low salt, it's as if all of the TN5 gets sucked into the hole. And we refer to this as CATAC for cleavage under targeted accessible chromatin. And our interpretation of this is that there's enough flexibility in the chromatin fibers so that the TN5 can reach around and, and get sucked into the hole. And if there's enough room in the hole to fit two TN5s and enough DNA that we could sequence, then you'll get a signal here, but you won't get a signal because uh, in linker regions because there's just not enough room to get all this stuff in there. And this predicts that small fragments will be favored. And indeed, that's what we see. So if we look at subnucleus some size fragments that we see that they really dominate. And this compares very favorably to a taxi. If we take the replicate that was used for the encode attack seek data, we use the replicate, one replicate to call the peaks, the other replicate to, to line up. We see that we actually get better occupancy for attack than attack seek is to itself. But what about RNA pol 2 the uh, pause pol 2 that I was mentioning that is responsible for bringing in the bath complex and causing the dynamic turnover at accessible sites? Well, that works even better. And if we look closely at examples like this one here, uh, which is representative, we see that there's really no difference between the ataxy and the pol 2 catac for the small fragments. The big difference is that for pol 2 catac, nearly, uh, nearly all the fragments are small, whereas for a taxi, because it's not tethered, you get one that might go into the accessible site, but the other one is more likely to be somewhere, uh, somewhere nearby. So we get much better resolution. But a point I wanna make here is that for the first time in 40 years, we have ground truth validation of an accessible site. That is, it's cause, causally, it's RNA, pause RNA pol 2 Now, since it is pol 2 we can, we can ask, okay, where, where does the fragment lie relative to pol 2 itself? So for this, we use ProSeq data, where ProSeq maps the RNA base in the active site of pol 2 So it gives us a precise map of PAL2's active site. And what we see is from the features, we have actually two features, one on each side, which implies that PAL2 is on both sides of the accessible site with on average about 130 base pairs in between. So paused RNA PAL2's map adjacent accessible DNA throughout the genome. And we haven't found any, any exceptions to that. In addition, we get very high signal in the noise, high data quality. This just shows what happens if we compare pol 2 attack to a taxi from ENCODE. If we down sample, we get high sensitivity and number of peaks. And we also get high signal and noise based on fraction of reads and peaks, which is the ENCODE measure of, of high data quality. So we get very high data quality and it's accessibly defined by pause pol 2 pause pol 2 has been around for like 2 billion years or so. And it's not like one of these uh, assays that just come and go every few years. Okay, but we can also take advantage of this insight and this simplicity of just of using an antibody to pause pol 2 and we can get joint active and repressive regulomes in single cell profiling by doing, by doing the following. So we mix the two antibodies. Don't worry about it. We're just gonna, we'll figure it out. And then we will use the CATAC conditions and do single cell barcoding and sequencing. And then our collaborators, Dominic Otto, Manu Seti, uh, have come up with a Bayesian deconvolution approach that they call two for one separator. It's actually conceptually pretty simple. So what we're doing here is we use as priors fragment lengths where small fragments we infer to be pause pol 2 and the nucleosome size fragments will be the uh, polycomb repressive complex. 
Okay. So now what we're going to do is this is the way that this is what theta looks like in uh, in this kind of representation where this thin this narrow peak you can see it's mostly blue so it's composed mostly of short fragments and the somewhat broader peak is mostly green so it's composed of of nucleosome size fragments. Okay, here's a contour map representation of the data. So what you can see is that here's the position. Here's the fragment length on the y-axis and the z-axis is the height. That's the fragment and density. So now we run our, <clears throat> uh, we run through, through the data with the algorithm. It updates the priors as it goes along and ends up giving us these two different contour maps, one for the polycomb and one for accessible sites. This works pretty well. Here you see the raw data in green. Here's a single antibody. Here's the deconvolved version. And you can see that they look pretty much the same to me. Here's the single antibody deconvolved version. They look pretty much the same to me. So the test is single cell. Here we mixed on the ICL-8 platform in such a way that we can we have these in separate, uh, separate wells so we know who's who. We array about 500 each of K562 and H1 cells. And we see that there's nearly perfect separation, both for the inferred pause pal 2 peaks and for the polycomb domains. So to summarize what I've shown you today, we can get efficient chromatin profile and cut rat, cut and run, cut, cut and tag and attack, multifactorial profiling, both multi-tag and two for one. Uh, I take home lessons are bivalency marks epigenetic instability in leukemias, replication coupled nucleosome deposition can explain PRC2 inhibition in the in these gliomas, pediatric gliomas, and PAUSPAL2 stabilizes BAF and defines accessible chromatin. And I think I mentioned people whose work about uh, whose work as I, I went through, uh, particularly Jay Sarthi. Uh, Derek Janssen's, Mike Mears, and San Fan Brahma Kamiyamid, who uh, were responsible for the studies I, I talked about. If you're interested in trying uh, any of these methods, uh, I suggest you go to Protocols IAO. And I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Anita, for the thought inspiring presentation. Um, if anybody have questions, you can post it in the chat and I will call you out and you can unmute yourself. Um, Tom, Tom Check. Hey, Steve, that was a, a fantastic talk. Uh, wow, my head is spinning. Uh, I had a question about the BAF-PAL2 interaction. Have you pinned that down to a particular protein-protein interaction? And if so, to which subunit of BAF? Or do you think possibly nascent RNA from PAL2 oh, could be the uh, recruiter? It could be, it could be. We don't think that it's contact. I mean, it, it, it could be, and there's some old biochemical evidence that they do touch, but they're big and, you know, they're going to hit. And, uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if they touch. No, the way we're thinking of it, and, uh, but, but actually we haven't been thinking so much about RNA itself. The way we're thinking of it is that the plus one and minus one nucleosome that PAL2, when it, when it hits it, we know that it disrupts it. It can, it can put torque on the nucleosome. And then of course, a lot happens at those. There's, there's chaperones that, that, that go on there. So we think it's actually disrupting the nucleosome a little bit that, that makes it a substrate for the BAF complex. I, but it could, be, it could be what you're saying, but that, that's the way we're thinking of it now. And we're currently trying to test that idea. Thank you. Um, I have one question. Um, so your lab obviously developed a lot of different uh, methodologies. Um, could you talk a little bit about how 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 you kind of approach that? Whether like is it out of necessity or any kind of specific mindset? Uh, no, actually. Uh, so let me just give you an example of something that that just came up this weekend. Um, so we've been we've been thinking about so we've been thinking about. Uh, this two for one idea and how to how to, 
so we it's not like like it comes out of the blue we've been the the two for one which by the way is not not published yet but i i you know it's a lot of fun to think about we we in thinking about it we came up with uh an idea for an experiment that will extend it even further so usually what we're doing is just uh thinking of uh looking at the data and realizing oh we this is an opportunity to get this out of the data. So, so it's you collect some data and then you look at it and then uh, say, well, maybe we can do better than that. So that's mostly what we've been doing. That's how the 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 uh, contact direct came out, the one they can do at home, you know, realizing, well, this is a problem. Why don't we just try to get rid of this step? Tried a lot of things that didn't work, but that it's mostly mostly trial and error. I can't say that there's one <clears throat> there's one large uh goal in mind it's it's just kind of <clears throat> uh we we do a lot of trial and error i'm only showing the ones that work <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you um gong yi zang has a question hey steve a really great talk so uh, my naive questions regarding the, your new technology cut and run technology do you ever check again the genome wide distribution of h3 3.3 Supposedly, this one is in rich enhanced region. I just wonder if you use your new technology, if you see the distribution changed compared to a, a previous result. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what you mean by previous results. So other people suggest that the H3.3 is a rich enhanced region instead of gene body. Well, uh, it's not. It's it's not an all or none kind of thing. So we actually what I show okay. So what I showed in the H3.3 lysine to methionine data, there was a heat map and it was ordered by H3K4ME2. And so what we're looking at is actually not in not annotated enhancers or promoters, but we're looking at with this mark, which marks both enhancers and promoters. And the difference, and so we're actually seeing that the that that it's over both. So the the only difference that we can tell between enhancers and promoters, based on the CATAC data that I showed you, is something that was proposed uh, quite a long time ago by Charles Danko, who basically said that they have the same chromatin conformation, and we I think we have good evidence that that's the case. You have the same chromatin conformation. So from a chromatin point of view, the uh, enhancer are, so the only difference that we can tell is that enhancers just have less, less pause pol 2 And that kind of fits with the fact that there are enhancer RNAs, but they're hard to, hard to even see. But if you look at pol 2 we can actually detect it with, the, with cut and tag. We can detect it actually quite readily, but there's clearly much less of it. So, so what I'm saying is that there's no clear distinction from a chromatin perspective between enhancers and promoters. And I'd say the same goes as I, uh, for H3.3. It's just going to go in wherever there's disruption because because uh, PAL2 disrupts and, and H3.3 is the only one around and the, the only H3 version around. So it, together with its partners, will fill in behind RNA PAL2. So the way we look at it is more mechanistically without worrying about whether, whether it's called enhancer or promoter. We don't, from our perspective, we, uh, it, it's all the same. Uh, qualitatively, it's the same. It's just different quantitatively. Thank you. Okay. I have a question, if that's all right. So, Steve, great talk. Um, I was curious about the mechanism of the H3K27M. So, I know previously there's been work showing that maybe it acts as a sequestration thing where the H3K27M sort of locks on a methyl transferase and prevents it from methylating other areas. Does your data with the 3.3 compared to 3.1 kind of suggest there must be at least some local effect? Oh, yes. Uh, it, it, do, it does, and that, that model actually uh, fell out of favor from work of other people. We, didn't, um, we were sort of starting with that, 
so so our model doesn't directly address that, but I think it shows very nicely that there's local inhibition at the site. And what I didn't show was, so that that's published work. And what I didn't show is our Drosophila work. So we did Drosophila work in common. And we showed that you actually need, in, in order for the, uh, in, in order for the inhibition of the PRC2 complex in, in Drosophila to occur, it needed to be incorporated into chromatin and needed to be in dividing cells. In Drosophila, we could do all those manipulations. So it's a general, it's a general thing that that we see with the with the methionine. I just didn't have time to show the data for that. But but yes, I I, I think that it's got to be local and it's got to be on the site. Other people were suggesting that it could be. Uh, it, it could be diffusible, but I don't think that it doesn't fit with our data. Thanks. All right, it's it's about one o'clock here in Denver. Um, unless if I, if I, if nobody else has any questions, um, thank you, Dr. Hanekoff, for spending the time and sharing your research. Thank you, Joe.